Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we're very fortunate to have John Pandit, also known as Pandit Ji, one of the founders in 1993 of the legendary band Asian Dub Foundation, um, a band that uh, many people of my generation uh, played as our soundtrack for many years. Uh, I was amazed to hear uh, early on in their career the song where they used a song from Nazrul Islam uh, from my own city of Calcutta, Ami Bidrohi, uh, I Am the Rebel Warrior. Uh, John Pandit, of course, uh, returned to my consciousness when he decided to tell the Queen that he was not interested in taking an MBE. Uh, in my book, uh, that's very high uh, as an act. Uh, John Pandit, welcome to News Click. Hey, thank you, VJ. It's an honor to be here, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, here we are, 2020, summertime, lockdown still. Lockdown still. You're sitting in North London. Um, yes. Boris Johnson is your prime minister. The first thing I'd like you to tell me is how has Prime Minister Boris Johnson acquitted himself in the midst of this pandemic? And the Conservatives have a knack for being contingent, whatever goes on, they jump on it, whatever it is, they will do. But of late, the kind of splits towards the right and the centre, the old patrician Tory has changed. And you've got now a kind of very much venture capitalist, you know, liberalism, let's just go for it. It's like the 19th century here. So Boris Johnson first thought herd immunity. Everyone can catch it, we'll see was he who drops and see who lives. And they didn't want to admit that there was a, that was their policy, but that was essentially it. So from that time, suddenly faced with the consequences that can happen to the economy, never mind people's lives, they've been playing catch up. And everything has been about trying to put a stick in plaster on a gaping wound. And so unfortunately, there's not much opposition to him either. So this has uh, reinforced his uh, position. So a bit like Trump, we're like second Trump. Yeah, we're, we're, we're suffering. And uh, I don't think the reckoning will come until a year or two's time. But economically, come the autumn, a lot of people are gonna find themselves out of work and it will be a shock. After the big boom of the start of the 90s, uh, the small recession sin, and then from 2008, we do not really know where we're going to be in uh, a year's time. So a lot of people have their heads in the sand and they're just waiting to see what happens. Um, ADF, Asian Dub Foundation, released a song recently called Stealing the Future. And yes. I've been listening to it. It's a very good song, very powerful song. strains of anxiety around Brexit, which have struck, uh, do we call it the British Isles still? I forget. This country has so many names, Great Britain, yeah, so United Kingdom, British Isles. It's a small country with a lot of names and I suppose a great deal of anxiety about what to name it. Uh, yes, this Brexit comes right before COVID, one cataclysm after the other. Um, yes. Talk a little bit about this Brexit thing, which must be part of you know, the continuing um, ambiguity and crisis in the country. 
yes, uh, Brexit. I mean, it's, it's it, it it polarized, it polarized a co country s straight away, and it co polarized people beyond sort of traditional class lines. Historically, um, the left were very much uh, uh, against the European Union as well. They saw it as a mechanism by which big companies could uh, control through the European Union. So there was issues about sort of even Tony Blair, when he was first stood for election, stood on an anti-European ticket, anti-EU ticket. So it's been latent, but the right has run with this agenda. And sometimes you thought, well, it's been quite convenient for a Conservative government because they've been able to blame the Europeans for faults that they have committed. They've created, uh, whether it's about immigration, whether it's about uh, subsidies, whether it's about whatever. And uh, now there's, uh, then the tendency arose to, to uh, attract a kind of uh, a laissez-faire, a new laissez-faire economy where all the old structures would be knocked back, the state would be shrunk massively, and we'd just get on with it, you know. And that's where the Brexit, the modern day Brexit idea came from. So, of course, it's, 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 it's caused difficulty in every organisation structure in British society, cut it across. So it's left a very fractured situation, which comes, when COVID comes on top of this, it's suddenly like, this is the wake up call because there's a feelings of grandeur. The Times ran an article just last week about China. The headline was, we're going to send an aircraft carrier to China, our newest technology, you know. Um, not remembering that nearly, was it 150, 200 years ago, they sent HMS, uh, uh, what was it called? Uh, Nemesis, Nemesis. The first paddle steamer up the Yangtze River, you know, up the Mekong to, to, to attack the Chinese. And there's no irony. It's like they don't remember anything. Their history, they don't remember it all. And they wonder now why the youth are tearing down statues of races, of slave owners, of Clive of India they want to get next, but it's white in Whitehall. It's a bit hard to get to. Well, let's come back to the statues. I, I actually want to ask you some more about this. So, I mean, Britain is, because of Brexit and this vision that Boris Johnson has of getting cozier with Donald Trump in the United States, uh, Britain has decided to take a hard line on China. I mean, this hard line on China seems predicated more on U.S. policy than, strictly speaking, British policy. Um, yes. Do you feel like there has been the, a growing sentiment against China in British society as well? Or is this something just being trumped up from, um, you know, from the Johnson administration, uh, from the yellow Indeed. press and so on? Yes. Certainly we always need enemies outside. This is how Britain exists. It's an island nation. It wants its enemies, you know, the Russians, the Venezuelans, <laughs> now the Chinese. And it's as if it never understood what his relationship with China was in the first place. How he got to this? What is Hong? What is Hong Kong? Where did he come from? And 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 now the situation is: you have a, a company in the UK who is going to develop up the tele, the next generation of technology, five G, called Hawaii. Hawaii, yes. And now they're saying we won't work with them because, you know, we might have our data. Britain has used this technology for 20 years in its various formats. If we do not upgrade our thing, we're going to be like the most backwards place in the whole of Europe. We will not have 5G. Everyone will have 5G. Everybody. They'll all be getting a download in a second, whatever, you know. And you know the way technology now leapfrogs. So like, say, in villages in India, People might have a mobile phone. They might not have a landline, but they have a mobile phone. And so this is the way we move on with what's most simple, most effective. In the UK, we're going to design our own. We're going to make our own satellite that does what the Europeans do, you know, for GPS. Uh, I don't know, we're laughing stock. And they've stopped flights to other parts of the world and back again. 
And part of me is relieved because if you go to other parts of the world, you go on holiday to Spain, people are just going to point and laugh at you. Why are you so stupid, you UK citizens? Great British Islanders, Albion, wherever you think you come from. <laughs> St George. And, and it is. And so everything becomes <laughs> sli slightly surreal, uh, but also deeply damaging. And it's... And we laugh at it now because we're at this point. We're like the in the we're like in the eye of the storm in the hurricane, and it's all calm. Whoosh! The winds are going to blow, and what will happen? It's, these things become catastrophic because it takes so long for the establishment to realise just how bad things have got, and then it just starts to dismantle, just falls apart. So that's I mean, where we are. Yeah. Very happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's go back to that. I mean, you've said some things that are, I think, important to reflect on. One of them is, well, Britain is, uh, and I often skip the great part of it, but it is interesting that the word great comes before Britain even now, even after all this. Mm. And there is an amnesia. You know, you said there's no irony about sending a warship to uh, the South China Sea. Well, y yes, the nemesis, HMS nemesis sailed up the Yangtze, you say. Yes, indeed. And then there is no sense of, uh, of history about the immense uh, theft from the rest of the world. And then out of nowhere, uh, because in the United States there are protests against statues, these protests begin throwing in, you know, uh, uh, you know, these, these horrible people, in, including Churchill, somebody wrote the word racist on a statue of Churchill. And you say Clive is hidden, ensconced inside a building hard to get to. But uh, there is a real reticence. Uh, you know, there's a real <laughs> there's an amnesia over Great Britain's history. And despite the fact that, you know, um, you can't have a cricket team without a fast bowler from Barbados. You don't seem to want to recognize your colonial history. What's up with that? Well, I don't like cricket anymore anyway. I don't bother with it. But UK, it's, it's, it's a thing that came after the Second World War in terms of a loss of empire. And a nostalgia came in. And it came in in the 60s. And it was Harold Wilson, this talk of you know, of, of the new things and white steel of technology, all this kind of, some of us is going to save us. And it was kind of like, that was pitched a bit like Blair, the third way beyond the right and left is this magical ground that somehow includes the establishment. I mean that by the royal family and everything, else, the, 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 the ceremony of state. And it's very hard to shake that off. And it's sold to, it's resold and repackaged and resold to us time and time again. Uh, I, 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 and it's nostalgia then. Culturally, um, our band, that, that was happening when we started, uh, kind of New Britannia, you know, Britannia Core, cool, all this kind of thing. So it's done culturally uh, in any way so often. And it's this belief that somehow the status is there. And we have this status, we have this special relationship with the United States. And from that, we're going to get some sort of pre preferential treatment over any other country. I want to get deeper into uh, this because, as I said, you know, inside Britain, uh, after the 1950s, large number of South Asians, Afro-Caribbean migrants come into the country um, in a way your band Asian Dub Foundation is a product of that migration, both Absolutely. from the Caribbean and from South mm -hmm. Asia. I mean, you know, it, it seems like a confluence of these migration histories. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you're saying that, yes, there was a revival in the Thatcher period of, you know, colonial grandeur and, you know, whatever it is, uh, these television shows, uh, you know, the precursor to to the glamour of the country house was, of course, you know, um, the shows about India and the Raj and so on. All that stuff was going on. Paul Scott, um, you know, I mean, yes. And then suddenly Asian Dub Foundation arrives with a very strong message uh, uh, saying that, no, we're against racism. But more than against racism, we are for uh, these communities that have been produced uh, in this last period, there's been a, a severe rise of racism in Britain 
as a consequence of Brexit, perhaps, the scandal around Windrush. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, there's been a real rise of racism. It's almost like Boris Johnson's arrival is a little like Margaret Thatcher's arrival, the kind of nostalgia for empire. Uh, Britain must break from Europe in order to be the Great Britain that it once was and so on. Uh, this must be very, very disturbing to you. I think it's a cyclical thing. It's, it's because it's happened in my lifetime, in, uh, you know, my formative years, 70s, 80s, a little generation in the 90s, it wasn't so apparent, but now it's come back full again. And like perhaps the other aspect of Brexit I didn't mention was that, yes, some people voted for Brexit with the, just their only attitude was an anti-immigrant. But prior to that, it was about refugees. It was about asylum seekers. It was about access to social welfare. And they were the key issues that, that sort of drove that and are there. And then, of course, at some stage, it's just revealed. And policing is the big issue. Uh, you know, um, Britain's police was created out of policing in Ireland, is England's first colony, is first part of the great, the great of Britain. And so it operates almost in some areas totally unaccountably and unaccountably as a, almost a, in some areas like an occupying force, particularly say for young uh, second generation Bangladeshis at the start of the uh, 2000s. Um, Parts, and, and this is historical. Southall, for the Punjabi community in 1979, and the murder of Blair Peach. Yeah, and now, there's a kind of more of a... It's amorphous, but there's a reaction to this quite strong. And then it goes further, and the people up the ante and, and not pull down statues of racists. So, all institutions are being challenged in the UK at various levels but it's not done in a coord. It, it happens. It's almost spontaneous. And um, it's the young people. It's uh, young people whose future has been taken away, you know. No chance to get, you know, opportunities for jobs, housing, education are being curtailed massively. And they're making, drawing their own conclusions. No one's telling them, they're drawing their own conclusions. And so we're getting, a, you know, slowly, it's very confused, but there is a reaction to this. And I think it's uh, going to be a powerful movement in the future. You know, one thing that I've already, always appreciated from afar of how you do things personally, you, you said, you just said it, you said they draw their own conclusions. Um, I mean, I, I know a little bit about the history of your band, Asian Dub Foundation, that you always wanted young people to draw their own conclusions. I mean, you came to this as a person organizing in the community, uh, as mm. I understand it. And yes. um, and the band was created out of people who were hanging around trying to create a community. I mean, one of your albums is called Community Music. Certainly but um, so in other words, it's to try to get young people to express themselves. And it's, I think it's an important part. And I'd just like you to talk a little bit about, you know, this life you've made of, of trying to channel the voices of young people uh, to reveal the facts of their life and criticize the fictions of the elite. In the 80s, I was involved in a youth community project called Asian Action Group in Haringey. It was a very tumultuous time. And a youth would come in and it was more, sometimes you've just created an environment that was safe. And they would get on and do, but they'd meet and they'd meet their friends and they'd be away from the tensions of you live in a geographical area or you go to a, a school, therefore you're my enemy, just kind of postcode, which kind of thing. And it was very instructive to me to see this because it wasn't just young Asians, young Indians, young Pakistanis, it was predominantly young Indians. They'd bring their friends in who might be Turkish, might be Greek, might be African, you know, descent. But they go to the same thing. So you create an environment where they meet and they could sort of get on with what they wanted to do. But even creating a space was in itself enough because if they're out and about, they might be picked up by the police, get into trouble with their parents, all that kind of thing. 
just a space. So I met uh, Dr. Das, uh, and you're up to there. Uh, um, we did some gig, and I see him experimenting with electronic music. I think this was about 1991. And I was DJing, I did that as well. I was just, I was doing community work in Tower Hamlets, youth and community work. I was quite blown away. I was, this is amazing. This is kind of, this is a mu uh, electronic music with, with, with like using Indian music and uh, it was heaven. So finally he worked, he was, but I didn't know this, he was working for an organization called Community Music and I got to meet him again later. And Community Music was teaching music to young people, all sorts of people, uh, particularly young people, uh, free music technology lessons, again for them, to, and he was a tutor for this. And so in 93, we decided in the summer, 27 years ago exactly, um, that we would get together a group of young people and they would make their own music. But there were musicians from various communities doing, some might be doing folk and they might be doing this, they might be doing this. And and it, but they were from different, so some were Gujarati, some were, yeah, some were all around London, get them together on a workshop. And it was only at the end of it that Dira Zaman, the, the rapper, who was 14, working with his brother State of Bengal at the time, said, let's keep this going. So, you know, we're all working or he's at school, or college, and, and then college, and then uh, nothing, but there was, um, why it started, <laughs> we get uh, asked to do in uh, Tower Hamlets uh, a, 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 a little gig to uh, fundraise for Kudus Ali, who was a young Bengali who got stabbed by racists in, um, in Tower Hamlets, and so within a week, I had to come up with a name, Asian Dove Valley, we caught it. And that's where it started. Uh, Chandra Sonic comes in, uh, uh, Sanjay Taylor comes in, and we form a little band. And it wasn't, we were all working still. And then it was only until about 97 we get signed. But in the meantime, we'd gone out to a place like Europe because the uh, environment at home wasn't there in terms of um, uh, trying to make any headway. But in Europe, you were a different thing particularly in France, working with Algerian musicians like Zemda. And it opened our ide ideas up as well. So it became a great... So from that, then we came back to the UK. Uh, and so that was how it is. But all these organisations, community music, our own music technology uh, organisation, were so rooted in this that it becomes like not something you seek out and do. It's just it's your only way you know how to organise, you know. And so this is continues, and I continue that sort of thing. I work with filmmakers now uh, as well, and uh, do a project um, uh, uh, with young Asians about, you know, just about the situation they found themselves. Things like the Prevent Program in the UK. This is all very important, and um, but it's important not to prescribe, but just people. If it's any good, people will make it themselves. That's where the talent comes from. But the talent in the UK has been like that historically. It's come from immigrant communities making music, but there's reggae music, there's bongro music. It's been there and it has shaped and it's reached out across. So when I come to when I came to Delhi, was it a year, two years ago, and I see Prabhdeep perform and playing the hip hop, and I'm looking at the way they innovate. When I see the hip hop movement, when I see uh, DJ Mo City and Reggae Rajas, I see uh, the all these guys and I'm going yeah some of these ideas we had way back when but now look at the level it's at now look what people are doing now and you take a musical form and you make it into your own you put your own thing on it you it's like a bit of the strand of RNA that just keeps unfurling and furling up again and creating new things new catalysts that get out there and just move it and so it's it's, it's a it's quite good as being one of the elders now to see this happen and it things because sometimes these the musical forms can just whittle out and you know but it's very good to see it and constantly working with young people it's been my privilege and and and, and seeing things develop and people get on and move things on it's very good but the thing is of course you're being uh, too modest because you say one of the elders seeing things in fact you are part of the unfurling of the rna even now i mean we're in the middle of this pandemic we started off talking about the pandemic uh, there is of course the terrible covid-19 
and you were telling me that there's a young musician balraj with whom you're working on a new track uh, which is reflecting on this pandemic talk a little bit about that and and we lend the the segment playing a little bit from that track so talk a little bit about that yes i had a um linked up i i see this guy um in manchester and on social media but i bought a record from him and it was a jamaican record but it was done completely acoustically and i just thought this is the best piece of music very positive uplifting who are these people in manchester so i i emailed them and we were talking but then that was it really you know just but then subsequently another uh, uh, sort of teacher lawyer music lawyer i was talking to him and he said i said to him do you know these lot in Ma- in manchester he said yeah i've worked with them they're really good i said introduce us so we got talking and he had put together a little bit of money from uh, some funding organization in leeds and the, and and it, and it was to explore how covid has affected uh, bame black and minority ethnic communities in the uk and um, we put together a team of a uh, 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 youth and community worker uh, a couple of uh, singers in uh, spoken word poets in jamaica in in um in manchester and brought uh, and i brought a tabla player in and it's a little piece of music uh called uh, i wish i could have hold you tighter when we last met in brackets oh what a joy and this is a truth is how we feel it's like i haven't seen my my uh, wife's elderly parents uh for nearly 2 3 months and they're in their 80s and they're at home their life is going to the gubra you know their life is um the community in in a little town in in harpenshire not far from us but far enough away and they've been totally cocooned isolated and i wish i could have hugged you tighter when we last met and it's it's the truth so get this to you and please yes i i hope you enjoy that's a beautiful beautiful slogan for um of course the covid period i wish i could have hugged, hugged you tighter when we last met uh i'm afraid we may be looking for some time at a touchless future but let's hope uh that it won't be long before we can all hug each other uh, john pandit pandit ji uh, thank you so much thank you sir lots of love to everyone thank you oh what a joy it was oh what a joy it was to sit with singers and players of instruments on that dirt field in abidjan we said abidjan to the audience and they said abidjan back we said abidjan to the audience and they said kingston back I ate a chicken from the chicken man and drank a soda from the soda can in the heads of this covid-19 19 we've been going through a pandemic anyway endemic epidemic like how do you classify it man it's all around the world do you know what i'm saying you know what i'm saying pan african south asian indigenous people of color color we've been going through this for time time Why started to amplify the crisis that people have been going through, but it's made it temporal. 